Why won't it rotate? It's no landscape for me. Da 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 da. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to my live. I thought I would do something different today and speak on this live more about how the effects that are going on in Europe as we speak today, um, especially when it comes to the European Union and how things are shaping with Russia. Now, many people are genuinely concerned about what's going on here. Um, personally, I'm a little less bothered. What will we be will be. There's not much I can do about it. And there's very little anyone else can do about it as well. What we can do about much of what goes on in the European Union is how it directly impacts us Muslims. How we can be seen as being charitable, how we can be seen aiding the weak and the needy that seek continually rush. And if there is going to be a war in the Ukraine, it is something for us to anticipate and see about allowing the Prophet, peace be upon him's mercy, be seen by the European people, because we are always seen in the media as the bad guys. This is an opportunity for us to actually show the beauty of our deen to a European community that genuinely only sees negativity about Muslims. Personally, I find it kind of disheartening when people tend to talk a great deal about our religion and lack any kind of knowledge in what they do and in how they do it. It bothers me considerably that people tend to speak about Islam with absolutely no knowledge about it. I, in fact, am very, very reluctant to speak about Islam because I lack knowledge. I think that's a very critical point of view. I don't tend to actually speak a great deal about our deen in purse the dean itself because of my lack of knowledge and yet you have people around europe especially european muslims like um european people like um tommy robinson and gerton wilder these people make my blood boil because they speak of our religion with absolutely no knowledge they take wiki pages they take the fear mongering that the media would like to whip into them and they apply it like it's like like that's us Wallahi, if we were terrorists, if the entire religion was a religion of hate and blood, the Western world would cease to exist. Mr. Elliot, salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to my life. Pleasure to have actually someone on instead of me just talking to thin air. <laughs> it's not exactly a genuine feeling mm -hmm. when I have to do it that way. It makes me feel a little bit disingenuous. <laughs> Um, it's nice to have feedback from people in the live. So, I mean, anybody who sees this, please make posts, make comments. Tell me what you think about um, mm -hmm. European um, Muslims in general. I'm probably going to have to turn that off because that's going to irritate me. Mosin, knock that off. If you're watching this, I'm trying my best not to have alarms going off. Uh, he's probably not even there, to be honest. <laughs> so it doesn't look like I've even got anybody in my chat room. I well, like probably zero it says on the list, so I'm five minutes in. Well, wallahi, five minutes is five minutes. But as I was trying to get to, European Muslims have a very different set of lives, problems. We have our brothers and sisters in France who are continuously persecuted. We have the issues uh, of things like Belarus weaponizing Muslims, inviting them over, then trying to push them into Poland, which is a country that is deeply hostile to our religion. To say that Poland is anti-Muslim is an oxymoron. It is enormously anti-Muslim. 
um, as a country in general and in political ideology, um, relatively speaking. So it's it, it's not um, something that can be genuinely measured when it comes towards European Muslims. Wa alaikum salam, sister, welcome to my live. People who do not understand how the European Muslim tends to live their lives, it's a mixture of considerable privilege in comparison to some of our Middle East brothers and sisters, and a mixture of persecution, fear and hatred, as well as some genuinely kind and caring human beings who generally don't care that we're religious. So it's, it is a bag of differences. Our, our experiences are very different from the experiences that our brothers and sisters have in the Middle East or in Africa or e e even across any other part of the world, like in Asia. Poland is probably the most anti-Muslim country in Europe, without any shadow of a doubt. And I have Polish friends and, um, and, and Polish reverts, who I call very close friends, who have um, made very clear that, they're, that their family are hostile. And I thought Irish people were hostile when it came towards me leaving um, me leaving the uh, of Catholicism. Um, completely the opposite when it comes towards Polish. The Polish will go out of their way. Wallahi, they will go out of their way to have issues with you if you have left uh, um, if you've left Western society to the point to join the enemy. And I think it's cultural because the Poles and, and much of the uh, Eastern Europeans did a great deal in fighting the Ottoman Empire. So, I mean, it's ingrained in Polish culture. So it, they, when they think of Islam, they think of the conquering Ottoman Empire. And that kind of conjures the, the images that appear in their minds instead of the beautiful deen that represents Islam by its nature. And this is a key problem of the perspective that Eastern Europe has of us. And in honesty, we should learn to dispel that very nature, speaking softly, openly, clearly, um, forwardness about who we are and how we behave is a very critical way of thinking in my opinion some people don't understand that they can get very angry because islam in europe is attacked it is verbally verbally and psychologically attacked almost all the time um you have to be a robust human being to be a muslim in in, in europe not so you know where let's be fair most of the muslims in the middle east are actually living in muslim countries those aren't muslim countries they all engage in compounded interest. They all engage in, in, in social engineering that does not necessarily uh, improve them on a Muslim scale. So, I mean, Europe is, in my opinion, the next, I don't know how to say this, je ne sais quoi, it is that next, it will be the next land. It will be the next opening of Islam. I think our next gold mage, because I don't believe that we are going to, that we are in the exact end time, that this is this is the end of Islam, the end of the world. No, actually, I must be honest with you. I'm, I, I must disagree with you there, uh, uh, Rakon. Um, Poland is incredibly, incredibly bad. In France, you can still be Muslim and not be attacked. Um, France and Belgium, they, you're just distrusted, disliked. But in Poland, Polish, Polish gangs will go around and attack Muslims. Heaven forbid you are happen to be a Polish Muslim. That's even worse. They've, 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 they've and I thought being, a, be, be, being an Irish Muslim was bad. <laughs> well, lie, I haven't got a shade to these people. But no, France is bad. Let's, let's not sugarcoat it. I'm not saying France is some kind of uh, paladin of pro-Islam. Um, I would dare say that Scandinavia or Germany is the most ben benign country to live in as a Muslim, um, next to possibly Italy. I think Italy is more ignorant or less interested in what you're doing, religiously speaking. Whereas Scandinavia tries to do its best to make everyone feel accommodated. I'm just saying that the the Poles, the po Polish Muslims are some of the bravest people I've ever met in my life because their culture is so anti-Ottoman that the idea of you sharing the religion of the Ottomans is almost like racial or tribal betrayal to them. So, wallahi, it's not the same for us. You know, we, we, we were never European, Western European, specifically, specifically Northern French, Scandinavian, Irish, 
British. We've never seen the sort of the swords of Islam, relatively speaking. The, the, so it's a, it's a clear indication of the nature of 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 Islam by 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 its virtue or lack thereof. But I'm just waffling at the moment. I'm just waiting for more people to come online. <laughs> So I can actually give them a conversation of actually what's worthwhile. Actually have some more than about one or two people. Oh, three in the room. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum to everyone joining my live. If you are joining, um, it is a pleasure to have you. Um, I'm open to any questions, any kind of uh, conversation. I'm going to be doing weekly lives now about on Thursday from two o'clock till three. So I'm kind of eager to get anyone's opinions, information, what you want to pass. Anybody want to talk, knock themselves out. Uh, my, light, my, my comment sections are wide open. And I'm genuinely very amicable. Is it the screen blank for everyone or is it just me? Uh, I don't think it's blank, sister. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Um, uh, Ibrahim. Ah, it's fine now. Might have been a bit of a screen issue there, sister. My apologies. But yeah, no, um, pleasure to have everyone. Like I said, anybody want to ask a question? My goal is to basically spread. Yeah, I didn't think it was blank for everyone. I think I think, I think you probably just lost the screen for a moment there, sister. I'm down to one person in the room. <laughs> I think connection issues are a problem. The topic is European Muslims. Um, and how European Muslims' lives are different from our Arabian, African, and and Asian brothers and sisters. Um, how the challenges of being a European Muslim are very, very, very different from the challenges of an Asian Muslim or even Muslims in in, in the in the Holy Land. And the prospects of what the mess that's going on in Eastern Europe and how it affects us. Um, in general, it does because you have to be very clearly aware that there are a horrific level a conflict is brewing and, and at some point it is going to kick off um h uh, h x i do not have a clue what you said i do not fluently speak arabic so i humbly apologize to whatever that was uh, let's see if i can actually translate that no i don't even have a translate model <laughs> <laughs> Ah, oh, wa alaikum salam. Um, thank you, sister. Like I said, um, my my fluency in is in, in Arabic is dreadful, beyond dreadful. In essence, I I I I'm still uh, being able to read it spoken. I'm getting better in Arabic. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Like I'm saying, the actual vocabulational is improving, and I've only been a Muslim a year. Whereas I hope so. I hope so. Alhamdulillah, I hope so. But my actual reading Arabic, nowhere near. <laughs> I'm not even attempting. I'm like, I'm looking at that going, it still looks like squiggles. <laughs> Stuff for Allah. I shouldn't be saying that about the beautiful Dean. But in general, I, I, I still have difficulty even comprehending what, what words are what in Arabic at the moment. Um, but yes, assalamu alaikum, everyone. Welcome to my live who's come on, um, all four of you. I'm talking about European Muslims. Um, anybody has any input, impacts, or anything like that, please, by means. 42, 42. Well, actually, no, I'm, I'm still 41. I'm 42 in about two, three weeks. Coming around the mountain when I come, you know, about four months. No, about four weeks, sorry. Oh, absolutely. No, 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 no. This is what I'm saying. We're not worse off in terms of food, shelter. The basic necessities are made for European Muslims. It would be it would be in area of me. No, I'm not married. Alhamdulillah, not yet. 
Yeah, no, uh, and, and that, that that is entirely true. I mean, to be fair, it is being Muslim isn't a problem for us other than online and social media and, and for our sisters. The amount of stuff for Allah, the amount of attacks our sisters get in public in Britain. I think the biggest problem with British Muslims is the attacks on our Hajabi sisters. And it's disgusting. And more and more men need to actually speak up about that. And it needs to be something that should be openly spoken of. When, when it comes towards things like... Um, <laughs> it, it, when it comes towards problems involving our sisters, we should speak up more about it, especially in Britain. You, every other, every every second or third. Sorry, I'm just going. To, that's not a problem. Yeah, especially the niqab sisters. Absolutely. I mean, every second or third thing you hear in the press that goes on involving Muslims and Muslim hate crimes, they're on our sisters. And we men need to speak more and be seen doing more. Our sisters are the jewels of Islam. Alhamdulillah. I know I've said that in one of my previous videos, but I say it again. They are. They're, they're the jewels. Heaven comes from the feet of our, our wives and our daughters. And this is a very critical part, part of Islam that I find very, very beautiful. It tells you to honour your mother and to love and honour your wife and your daughters. And I think that should be something that should be always reinforced especially amongst young men especially in this day especially in this dunya of today you know when it's easy for young men to think that they're something more than what they are you know it, we it, maybe it just takes a few decades for, for, for boys to get an idea of what it means to be men um or maybe i'm just rattling on because i'm actually mature enough to observe these situations but it needs to be said and i personally and, I, and, and it isn't even exactly peaches in the german uh, muslims either our German brothers and sisters don't have it exactly peachy. There's uh, there's an uptick of anti-Islam in Germany as we speak, which is quite frightening when you think about it. Um, there's also an uptick of, 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 of anti-Islam across the whole of Europe, to be honest. But it's not as prolific in Germany and Scandinavia. And even in Britain, to be honest, people give my country a lot of stick, but it's not that bad. I mean, it could be far worse. France, Belgium, they're far worse countries to live in Islamically than they are here. Wa alaikum salam. Welcome everyone who's coming. But no, no, Germany is bad, but nowhere near as bad as some of the countries that are out there. I mean, France and Belgium are probably the worst next to Poland, and I cannot stress this enough. Poland, from Muslim point of view, is one of the most horrific countries to be in. Um, hostility is, is an understatement, relatively speaking. And more needs to be said about it. And the disgusting behaviours of people like Belarus and the Russians weaponising human beings and their tragedy a stuff for a lie. It has to be spoken out about. Now, that doesn't mean I'm looking to procure something. Yeah, with Britain, it is a subtle thing. But the British racism is, is ingrained. It's, it's not as bad as some other European countries. But British racism is, is still a problem. <laughs> Ah, Jordan sent you, did he, a few weeks ago? Fantastic. Um, oh, that was that was weeks ago, was it? Um, yeah, no, I, I to be fair, I've been meaning to have a longer live session, and today's about European Muslims and how our lifestyle is different from others. So you're welcome to the thing. Any questions, anything anyone wants to pose to me, knock yourselves out. We're pretty much open open to conversation, gentlemen. I do like Q&As, to be honest, um, especially when they're not on a site where I can get banned for answering any questions, even with the controversial ones. You know, that's one of my grievances with TikTok and much of social media in general. You have to curb how you talk. And I believe absolutely in, 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 in freedom of expression and freedom of speech. But no, I, I, I think it's quite absurd that people don't want Muslims around. I mean, we're one of the most lawful religious communities you can come across. We have a nature where we are told, we're given, we're given literal divine commandments to obey the laws of the land around you. Let me see that again. 
uh, Turkish are hardwired in, in in Germany, so Islam is part of Germany nowadays. Therefore, the German regime has to tolerate Muslims. Mm, fair enough. I mean, I, I don't know how big the actual Muslim um, community is in Germany, to be honest. TikTok gives me anexia. It throws so much at you. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. TikTok is incredibly toxic place. <laughs> I don't know how some Muslims stay on there all day long. I have... I can do it in blocks. I take 10, 20 minute blocks and that's it. I've got to get off because it, it, it'll it assault you. It hits you like a train TikTok. Instagram less so. Um, one of the things I like about Instagram is how many cat pics are everywhere. There's like cats. Are like, meow, meow. They're everywhere. Absolutely everywhere across uh, um, Instagram. It's probably one of the things I like about Instagram uh, is how many cat pics are out there. <laughs> Um, but no, TikTok is incredibly toxic. But no, Germany, I, I didn't realise Turkey has a big population in Germany. Um, I genuinely thought that um, Germany's population is uh, of Muslims was a lot smaller than, 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 than that gave indication for. I know they're quite large in Vienna, um, Vienna the city thereof, because I've been there, and the Muslim community is something like 100, 120,000 people there. I'm glad I'm making people laugh. That's genuinely my goal, is to make people laugh. I, I generally find if, you, if you're laughing at me or you're laughing at something I'm doing, then at least you've made, made something of a day. Uh, Gammon M. Gammon M or Grammy M? I'm exactly sure what you mean by Grammy M. <laughs> Wallahi. Ugh. Laughter is laughter is always therapeutic. This is what I'm saying. Laughter, laughter is one of the greatest things you can give to people in society in general. It's what makes us better human beings, laughter, and proves to be of a more formal, beneficial um, social structure. Oh, so do I. Absolutely. Laughing is one of those things that makes us who we are as humans. But occasionally you have to talk about serious matters. And the business that's going on on the European border is serious. Um, life, not always. It should be fun sometimes, but it can be. It has to be quite serious from time to time. I have lived in Muslim countries and also in non-Muslim more religious in non-Muslim countries. No, I don't get that either because I see that. I see that a lot. Alhamdulillah, the Muslim community here in the West is very religious, and yet I've been told the Muslim communities in the Middle East. Which I've never, I've, I've been to North Africa, and the North African communities I've seen are generally quite religious. But the ones actually in the Middle East, where amongst the UAE and that lot, are apparently are very, very, you know, less religious. Laughter keeps you young. Oh, that's why you're so young, Sister Lily. Mashallah! I wonder what your fountain of youth was coming from. <laughs> We don't have what we had back home. The fact that they can hear the other is a big thing. This is, you see, now that's one of the reasons why I would consider moving to Turkey or Morocco. But then the more I see how Morocco is deporting people from countries, the less supportive I am of their government. Their king, I think, might be a bit on the weak side when it comes towards dealing with his own politicians. Um, I think it's because he doesn't want to be seen rocking the boat when it comes towards democracy. Um, for whatever that's bloody worth. Let's take a look at the modern democracy. It's a joke, in my opinion. Um, it's one of the few things I don't necessarily agree with. Freedom of expression, freedom of speech, absolutely. Democracy? Democracy is an engine for the corporate world to take the people for a ride. But that doesn't mean I'm pro-communist pro either. It just means I know the faults in capitalism and democracy, and they can't be allowed to ex be exploited. Laws should be written to defend people. This is true. This is very true, Sister Lily. Muslim countries uh, um, and societies make it easy for you to be a Muslim. Here it's easy to sin, and sin are so normalised, but back home it's different. This is very true. I mean, it is easy to sin, um, but it's also extremely easy 
to allow authoritarian governments to mistreat Muslim people when the governments don't get their way. You see, this is the problem. I mean, you only have to look at some of the things that are going on in Jordan and Lebanon and how incredibly institutionalized the corruption there is that no one can actually do anything about it. You know, um, and, and how the Saudis are now turning on our Palestinian brothers and sisters after refusing now that they've, they're normalizing relations with the Israelis. And so is everyone else around them. And this is, again, something that makes my blood boil. How can you normalize relations with the people that are occupying the Palestinians? You know, it, it tends to narc me that people find this stuff acceptable. And I just, I, I get the impression that it's because people are expecting it to be normal these days. But anybody who's new to my life, please, you're welcome. Everyone, I love my gaze. I feel like you're the most purest human love. I don't think all Muslim countries are corrupt. I think that's misinterpretation. Some are, let's be fair about that, and by the nature of who they are. But I think that Algeria, uh, Morocco in general, isn't a corrupt country as far as I've seen and know of it. Turkey is a bit because it's very much in the NATO pocket. Um, and I just, it depends on horses for courses, where, where the, the core Muslim countries, UAE, Saudi Arabia, all the big oil dispensing countries are incredibly corrupt, incredibly corrupt by the nature of them, but by what they sell to the West and the rest of the world. Um, Persia is no different. I'm not, I'm not exactly shielding Persia from that kind of criticism as well. Persia is just as corrupt as Saudi Arabia in terms of financial and industrial capacity. And a lot of that is to do with the West. Well, it's called irony. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I just, the idea that I would like to live in a society, the, my problem is I want to take the best of the West and then add Islam to it. This is very true. This is very true. The, the, the Muslim rulers are attached to this dunya, very much attached to this dunya. And yet the rest of us are too busy wondering about our deen, thinking about the, uh, the next life. Oh, a stuff for a laugh. Lily, not a chance. I'd resign immediately. I just, not a chance. Me as the Muslim world leader. Oh, I'd, I'd outlaw the use of oil. I'd destroy the oil economy overnight. It's haram. It leads to banking. Strike it off the books. <laughs> Declaring uh, oil haram. That would be something. <laughs> Watching every Saudi prince and businessman cry. Oh, that would tickle me. <laughs> to be fair, we don't need oil anymore as a species, um, as, a, as the human race. As, uh, we don't need it. Um, and uh, oil in upon itself is, is, is an extremely toxic um, material. It damages our planet. It, no, no, completely. Imagine it. Imagine, imagine outlawing oil. A stuff for Allah. You could imagine the Arab lords crying. Absolutely crying. <laughs> oh, I'd be assassinated in about the first week. Oil is haram! <laughs> Declaring oil haram. Yeah, I, if it isn't the Muslim lords who kill me, it'll be the Americans. <laughs> I'll be dead in a week. I would. I'd be dead. Sister Lily made this comment about me becoming the, the Muslim ruler president of the world. Not a chance. Oh, they, it's entirely plausible. Like I said, it, it, there are so many memes online about America bringing democracy to anyone who's got oil. You got a problem? Like, let me, let me be fair about this. I love Somalia. I love how rich and ancient its culture is, and as its people are, and how magnificent a country in its history is. The problem being is it has nothing of value, and because of that, the West and the world does not give a fuck. You know what I'm saying? And that's why the Somalian warlords 
and various factions have been allowed internationally to get away with what they've been doing since the 90s. 30 fucking years this has been going on, you know? And because of that, no one cares. Somalia has no resources the West wants, and China only wants to use it as a stopover. They literally just want a port. So no one cares what goes on in the countryside of Somalia. Even the Africans don't care. And that, 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 that's, that's the key reason. There's no money to be made. Therefore, people don't give a damn. No one wants to invest. And, that's, and, and it's not even like that that's a, that's a uniqueness of just Somalia. That's a uniqueness of any country around the world. Let's take a couple of the smaller South American countries, like Uruguay, Uruguay, Uruguay I can't pronounce it very well, and Papua New Guinea and, and, and places like Ecuador. Dirt, filthy, poor countries with amazing, lovely human beings and people. But the reality is they've got nothing of great value that the West wants, so the West ignores them. You know, and so that they're the crime families. And this is one of the reasons why Mexico is so riddled with the cartels. It's because they've not got any great value. So the West tolerates them and tolerates their crimes and the drug cartels. I mean, a consecutive effort made by Western military men would end the crime of cartels, but there's no money to be made for it. Don't worry. No, no. What did you just say, Sister Lily? Don't worry, I'll be the president of Somalia and everything will be fine. <laughs> oh, a woman president. Oh, now I know you're blaspheming there, sister. Yeah, no, absolutely. A absolutely. And that's a mixed blessing as well. Because if those countries can develop themselves without immediate value from the West, it means they can make their own stability. And making your own stability is, in my opinion, a far greater gift than possibly running around fighting and dealing with invading nations and countries. It's about time. <laughs> oh, Sister Lily for President of Somalia. <laughs> oh, oh, get in there. Fight. Oh, we have our feminist sister Lily having a, uh, having a knuckle to bash with somebody. I know she's going to have goes at me for calling her a feminist or alive. <laughs> no, wallahi, my sister is not a feminist. Sister Lily's no feminist. But she's uh, a very much a woman empowerment. I was deepening something recently. Countries run by f females are better. Oh, whoa. Are female leaders better leaders? We don't know. Um, I'm just happy. I will be honest with you, there is so little evidence of modern, within the last five, six hundred years, history of women-run countries. Um, because, I mean, we can't use the Western, the, the Western monarchs. Take that back. <laughs> Sister Lily, I did. I already apologise. Shush, yeah? So, the, the, whereas Queen Elizabeth... Um, Marjolon and all the others and all the other female rulers were figureheads in their countries. Their countries were still run by men. So we don't know enough to clarify whether a woman run country would work. We don't know because it's never been done. There, there are no women cabinets. There are no women run governments uh, in per se. Queen Elizabeth II was not, uh, is not the ruler of our country. Queen Victoria, even in the 1800s, was not a ruler of our country. So we don't know. that It's fair to say that. And I, I don't even feel bad at saying that as a historical point of view. We don't know what a woman-run country looks like. I don't know of any examples internationally of where a country is run by women. As of yet. New, maybe New Zealand's done it. Women should lead in the house when it comes to raising the kids and giving them great... Uh... <laughs> I am not touching that with a barge pole. I am not going near that with a barge pole. <laughs> Did they try it in the Philippines, women as leaders? Well, you know, you see, in Germany, no, no, Angela Merkel, still more than half of her government were male-run. More than half of Angela Merkel's government was male run. You see, as I'm saying, we've never actually seen, to use the her jobless word, a woman run government yet. Where all the posts are ran by women, the prime minister or president is a woman, and it's run from a woman point of view. 
Uh, I don't know. I mean, we, 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 the world's had multiple women leaders. We've just never had a women-run government. And I think that would be something interesting to see. Um, everyone would be fine. Every, every, everything would be absolutely fine until we get to that one period of the month and then everybody male in the company needs to duck. <laughs> I know that's probably extremely inappropriate, but that is. And women, run, uh, women uh, not being profit, for example, uh, tells us a lot. Absolutely. I, and I agree with you, sister. Absolutely, women not being profits. Again, I, I, I agree with that sentiment entirely. This is devolved. This entire life is devolved into uh, whether women would make a good rulership. <laughs> I'll be honest, I don't know. I, 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 from an academical point of view, it'd be interesting to know. I, I, I'd be curious to know, created to be mothers for the most part. So I guess it is very difficult to have a woman uh, uh, as a president of the country. If she ran the country as a motherly behaviour... Well, Lahi, that might actually work. If a country was badly damaged to the point that where it could be run as a, a, a as, as a healing kind of mechanism, then yeah, that, that would probably work. Uh, psychologically, men are interested in things and women are more interested in human beings. Women have their own fields where they can do better than men. This is absolutely true. We weren't built equally. We were built, we were built uniquely to complement each other. Alhamdulillah. And the idea that pure equality exists is a fallacy. I am physically stronger than most of my human sisters. Um, most of my human sisters are more intuitively aware of society and social interaction and human beings than I am. You know, each of us have our own unique strengths that we bring to the tables of human beings. So equality is not exactly what you expect in Islam. It's uh, it, it's more uniqueness of each individual role changing who we are. And in that regard, I think that's a beautiful reality and a thing of who we are. This is actually quite fun, this inter this one's been very interaction. So women are nurturing and emotional beings compared to men psychologically. Not always the case. In general, yes, but not always the case uh, um, in, intrinsically. There have been examples of, of, of women and men having reversible roles. Not really. I don't think you see the Iron Lady. People talk about Margaret Thatcher, like the Iron Lady, as if she is some great edifice of women emancipation. But she was a very, very conservative woman and still held extremely conservative values. I mean, Theresa May is an example of another political leader who you could say is very masculine in how she ran the United Kingdom. Um, I say run in the loosest tense when we're talking about um, Theresa May. Oh, OK. Well, it should be more emotional. I, I should have said absolutely. Absolutely. No, no. In that regard, I, I agree with your sentiment. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they can't be more masculine. There are examples of masculine men, uh, masculine women, who by their nature exude a level of authority that can allow them. I mean, Hillary Clinton is, is, is the poster child of a masculine woman. Anyone's better than Boris Johnson. Wallahi, anybody on this planet is better than Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson will go down in history as our absolute worst prime minister the United Kingdom has ever had in any way, shape or form. Um, he is, he's worse than Neville Chamberlain. And I didn't think I could, I would, I, I, as, a as a historian, I would never thought I'd say that, that Neville Chamberlain was a better prime minister than Boris Johnson. Neville Chamberlain's crime was being naive. Boris Johnson's crime is being a deceitful, lying, backstabbing, corrupt, uh, the rules don't apply to him, pile of regurgitated pond scum. And that's Boris Johnson in a nutshell. The man has never, ever been allowed to have say no to him before. Yeah, men advisors, this is what I'm saying. Much of Western society, much of Eastern society, women who have been in power have always had men as support around them. No, I, I, to be fair, to be fair, that was a vote change. Like I said, that was entirely calculated. I don't believe he actually believed that. Wallahi, I don't think he believed that. I think it was more designed to get the right wing vote behind him. 
And in that regard, he's incredibly dangerous. Because if it was a faux pas, we can forgive him for that. Wallahi, you can forgive him for that. He did it because he was courting the far right. And that's disgusting. It's worse than you think it is. Jo Boris Johnson, when he made those comments, was making a calculated decision to court the radical far left, right. So it's, 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 if it, if it, if it had been just a matter of stupid comment, we could have easily have, have forgiven him for that. Um, but Boris Johnson was doing it to court the, the, the populist right. And he is, he's a populist in general. He's not even what you'd call a proper conservative prime minister um, in at the fact of the way he behaves how he's blackmailing MPs who are calling him into question. I don't think he'll make it out of the beginning part of this year. I expect him to be gone by March. Um, but then I said that about Feb uh, about over Christmas. He's definitely on his last legs. Oh, no, no. He, he, I, I can't stand... And I would consider myself a moderately conservative man. I vote for local politics. So, yes, I voted for my local MP, who is conservative. and But I've also voted for Labour MPs as well. So I tend to vote what is more local than party, but I would vote for anybody that would get rid of Boris Johnson at the moment. There are some honest politicians, not many of them. Um, they are far and few between, but the ones that actually work for their communities. Oh, Allah, my apologies. Um, in, in specifically fuel shortage. This conflict with Europe in general is based around Europe and Putin. Putin has a legitimate grievance with NATO. NATO has been gobbling up countries on Russia's border, making Russia paranoid. The Russian people are, by their very nature, extremely nationalistic, extremely prideful of their country and their country's history. They were prideful of their Russian empire. So when you're sticking interceptor rockets on their borders, up and down the NATO lines, you are provoking the mayor of Russia. And I don't agree with that. And I don't agree with the, well, the guarantee of not including uh, um, uh, Ukraine could have been done overnight. Do you know what I'm saying? This entire conflict could be erased overnight by a guarantee from NATO. No, we're not going to move into Ukraine. We're not going to go any further eastward. We made these promises in the 90s. Western leaders made these promises in the 90s and then ran them straight over. So, yes, there is a great deal of risk that's going on there right now. And but then it's the nature of. Of Western uh, politicians to lie through their teeth. How do you know a Western politician is lying? He's speaking, especially on the world stage. Anybody with world power, especially things like Boris Johnson, Mark, any one of our current political leaders in the Western world, I wouldn't trust them with a, 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 a nursery full of babies. I wouldn't. Wallahi, I'd be too worried about the babies getting hurt. Let alone any other type of lunatic behaviours they engage in. I mean, we only have to take what they've done to Gaddafi, they've done to Libya, done to done to Saudi, uh, to Iraq, what they've done to Syria, to not take the Western leaders anywhere near serious. And yet, I'm not defending Putin. Vladimir Putin's not some angel. He's not some. This isn't some ringing endorsement of Vladimir Putin. I don't like the guy either. To be fair, he's extremely anti-Islamic as well. I just feel that Russia is being provoked into this situation. And if Russia cuts off the fuel, there could be other implications. German people getting freezing, uh, lack of fuel consumption, food for shortages. And we could very likely lead, lead to a war. There is the prospects of a war kicking off in Europe. And people don't realise that. That, that Russia could, there could be a war by proxy. Russia invades uh, Ukraine. Mercenaries are hired by the West. Supplies backwards and forwards. Why do the Ukrainian people need to be the chessboard piece between Russia and the Western world? That's my biggest fear. And this is why I think that the, the Ukrainians shouldn't try to embrace uh, uh, NATO. Because I think it would be a disaster. I genuinely feel that it would be disaster. It would be loss of life for the Ukrainian and loss of life for normal people. And everyone in between Russia and Europe are going to suffer. You see, America is not going to suffer if Russia even engages in the, in the Ukraine. There's no way that this is going to affect the average American, but it will affect Germans. It will affect Poland. It will affect the, the, the Lithuanians and, and, and everyone else around that border. And it will most definitely affect the Russians. 
And that's all the Americans care about. They can prove that they're the big people, that they've managed to harm Russia again. And that resonates with boomers. You don't understand how, wallahi, how much that resonates with boomers. I got those communist bastards again. Literally, the boomers love that kind of stuff. It, it's insane when you think about it. And, and this is the whole thing. Uh, uh, Putin is still living out the Cold War. And we shouldn't feed his ego. We should, we should do the minimal amount of things necessary for peace and leave them alone. If there's any, if there are tribes in this world you should leave alone. And the Russians are one of those people you should leave damn well alone. Because they're not sane. They're not sane people. You should watch how their police behave to realise how crazy the Russian police are. And then you realise the kind of level of how craziness the Russian people are. Just by their nature of who they are and what they do. It's kind of astounding that some people actually don't realise that Europe is such a precarious, peace is such a precarious thing to hold. And it is. It's, it's such a beautiful thing and so difficult to maintain. And I don't think people actually realise how valuable peace is. And it could engulf us. And I wouldn't be surprised if it, if it devolved into nuclear warfare. Because we have an idiot, we have a dribbling idiot in America. A populist here in Britain will do anything to stay in power. <laughs> I don't know about how why Putin walks the way he does. I think he probably thinks it makes him look hard. <laughs> but to be fair, for a man in his age, he's extremely healthy. He works out a lot. And he is an extremely healthy person. <sighs> oh, excuse me. Is there anything else anybody wants to talk to me about? You know, we've been on this live now for absolutely ages, nearly 47 minutes. Um, we haven't really, I haven't really covered much, except the fact that I do believe that European Muslims do have different and hard, harder in some regards and weaker in others. We're not fighting for health, food, shelter, like many of our other brothers and sisters are around the world. Wallahi, may Allah protect them and guide them to a better life. Um, but we do have problems here in Europe. And I think people need to acknowledge, we Muslims need to acknowledge that there is a problem inside Europe, with the, uh, inside the European Muslims community, and we need to address it. And this lack of addressing it is our problem. We're always watching ourselves outwards. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing that we don't observe what's going on in the Middle East or in Africa or in all these places that need our help, but we can't ignore the wounds inside our own community. And there are wounds, and that's the point. There are problems. Um, there are things I want to discuss about involving European Muslims, but I don't want to alienate people. <laughs> You know, things like the honour system that we have here in the British Muslim community and, and the unwillingness to for reverts to get married um, in general in the Muslim communities, in Western Muslim communities. Um, there, is, there is a big stigma about inviting reverts into your families, um, especially across certain parts of the uh, uh, um, organisation. Right, my account is my accent isn't Irish. Absolutely, I think that's probably a very good idea to have. I grew up in Belfast when I was very, very little. I left um, Belfast when I was a child. Um, Wallahi, my mother and parents moved to um, London. Um, we started in Croydon, where a lot of my formative years were. Moved into Peckham, moved in from Peckham to um, Tower Hamlet. And then from Tower Hamlet, my family then moved back around, back and around uh, the Croydon um, London area. Um, and so, so, so a lot of travelling done for much of my youth. But when I'm with my Irish family, I tend to speak a great deal of a more of an Irish accent. My accent softens. And I have something a little bit of a, an Irish tang to my voice. You won't notice it now because, quite honestly, it, I have to hear it for it to connect to, to my ear, to my mouth kind of response. Um, when I'm around my Irish family. Um, but I haven't seen or spoken to them in many, many years. And I don't even, what, what I would say, have a very strong London accent either, because I've travelled a great deal extensively. 
and I live in the countryside these days. So I have a much more colloquial kind of accent as it is. But I used to, a long, long time ago, I, I had an accent. I hope that answers the question for you. Uh, ooh, who was asking? Who's, who's asking? I'm just happy. Any other questions? We've got 10 minutes to kill, guys. Come on. <laughs> I do need to pray, too. Wallahi, I haven't prayed yet. That's 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 bad. <laughs> oh my neck. Any questions anyone wants to ask? I don't even know what, if this to lose ten minutes. Yeah, no, I'm only gonna do about an hour, H. Um, to be honest. I've been on here I've been on here nearly an hour now. And I, I can I, I think it's more because I can't concentrate longer than an hour. Um, and maintain focus on the conversations and the material that I'm asked to uh, drag up from just memory. So it, it, it can be extremely taxing on the grey matter. <laughs> um, especially when you get old and decrepit like me. Ah, la, la, la. What was that question I missed earlier? Why does Putin walk funny? No, I answered that. Back to my topic. Where they, no, it's not. It, it, Europe is not so much in danger of a food shortage. It's more in danger of political instability because of Russia taking issue with it. Um, there is, there is, there, the, Europe is in the most precarious political side show I've ever seen right now. And the problem being is a lot of European countries don't have militaries. A great deal of Europe is actually protected by Britain, France and America. It's quite frightening actually. When you think of the population of Germany and the size of her military is almost a joke and it's not a good one um, in, in, as, in aspect of the fact that the, the population of Germany is staggering and yet her military you could fit it in one of the in a couple of the a couple of the brigades in Britain. Wa alaikum salam. Welcome in uh, Indonesia. Lovely to speak for you. But no, the European situation is precarious politically because anything could possibly happen. Is mourning the past haram if done frequently? I please ask a scholar. Um, I will be honest with you that I think so, but please ask a scholar because they would know more than I do on that subject. I know very little about the mourning ceremony, but I think if you were to do anything consecutively, it could be haram if it's misappropriately uh, undone, if that makes sense. And I'm only just using logic there. I don't fully know myself, so I can't give you a, 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 some kind of a ruling, if that makes sense. I'm not even, I'm just a lay follower. Uh, stuff for Allah. But honestly, I would look. I, I would look for other people online, um, or, or or speak to your local sheikh. That's a question you should ask the sheikh. To be honest, and it's that, that's just my general advice. Whenever I'm on lives on, on on other social media as well, don't take people on 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 social media too seriously. Um, they may not. They may not necessarily have a clue what they're talking about. Let's take me for example. <laughs> Let me share something here in Islamic equations like is 10, it could be 5 plus 5, 6 plus 4, 2 times 5. I, it's not about 5 plus 5 when 10 as only answer is Islam is the most flexible religion. Yeah, no, no, I, I can attest to that. And I can agree to that. I think that's a, that's a pretty profound way of looking at it. Yeah, not something I would have personally have perceived. Think back to your childhood every day and you need to snap out of it. Very much so. We need to think and act like adults. 
because we are the adults that are responsible for the Muslim children of tomorrow and the ones that defend our elders. Anything else? Anybody else want to pass anything else more amongst the, 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 the monotonable horde of all five of you? There's a bit of, like, like, it peaked at 10 one minute. Oh. I think everyone else is getting bored of my voice as much as I am. <laughs> I guess I'm not a fan of actually speaking about myself, to be honest. By my nature, I'm a very private man. I don't go out of my way to inform people of what I do around my life. Uh, that's dangerous considering I'm, I'm trying to be a YouTuber. <laughs> you know, you're gonna have to speak about yourself a bit more than what you'd like to. Hot voice, ah, stuff for a laugh. Sister, I don't think hot voice is even remotely on, on, on the to-do list with me. Oh, oh, well, I apologize. Because of the, uh, of course, stuff for a laugh. A stuff for a laugh. I know. I don't know when I have to ask, maybe just listen to you at the moment. That's perfectly fine because of the tea. That's entirely plausible. Um, if you can't pray, Salat, standing up, you sit. If you can't sit, you lie down. If you're in a, if you come, that looked good. If you come, acquire prayer later if we're dead people will pray so that for you for the last time it was a joke <laughs> no it's not a problem it wasn't that bad h it wasn't that bad uh just a little after three o'clock H, your English isn't that bad at all. I've seen far worse English speaking from English people. Some of the worst people who speak English, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be pleased to, if I get pulled up on this, Northerners, especially that lot from Yorkshire. Yorkshire? I'm from Yorkshire. Newcastle. Their accents are absolutely, you could, you, you could scrape my nails down a blackboard and I'd still, ugh. What is my favourite food? Ooh. My all-time favourite is pie and liquor. But that's a very much a London recipe. It's, uh, it's mashed potato with sauce, a pie, and some fish eels, um, generally in water or, or, or jelly. Um, and it's a very, very traditional London food. Scouses and Mangovians. Absolutely. Get out of here with those dirty accents. I've got no time for scousers. Mancunians. <laughs> I'm gonna get I'm I'm gonna get absolutely torn into by some of my friends. Because some of my close friends are Mancunians. And, uh, and and northerners. No, I'm not a fish and chip fan, to be honest. I like fish and chips, but not every day. It's not what people think it is. I don't. I, I'm not a big fan of fish and chips on every day. Not even every month I'll have fish and chips, but I don't mind the occasional fish and chips. If that makes sense. And I genuinely think my favourite food, without any shadow of a doubt, is probably going to be spaghetti bolognese, especially the way my mum used to cook it. I know, crazy, 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 crazy food. So, oh, there are eight people in the room. Oh, vinegar. No, God, no. Oh, stuff for a laugh. Vinegar. That's vile. 
vinegar or anything except being put in a cooking pot. Not a big fan of vinegar added as an extra condiment. My mum's food is absolutely the best. My mum will my mum is and always has been the greatest cook I've ever met. In fact, she was one of the people that made all because of the way she cooked was the reason I took a, a mid career in chefing for about ten to twelve years. But it's been a pleasure having you all. That's the hour, and I'm going to cons consider shuffling off to pray and to discuss my mind. I have not been to Mecca yet, no. But it has been a pleasure having everyone on this live. And I uh, hope to see you next Thursday, if you're all coming. Alhamdulillah.